watch, he drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground and he died. No kidding. I've often heard it said that bad times make good men, good men make good times, then the good times make bad men, and bad men make bad times. And so the cycle repeats itself over and over and over. And you know, I, I like this, uh, this idea, and I feel like it's true naturally throughout the course of history. We see in, in different kingdoms and different nations and different religious systems that we see this cycle repeat itself over and over. And this is kind of how I used to think of things, but I feel like there's a, a better, maybe more biblical way to look at this. And this is that bad times make selfless men who realize the error of their ways and who rise up and decide to honor the Lord by the power of his spirit. Then those selfless men, like King David, for example, make good times for their kingdoms, for their nations. But then those good times make selfish men once again, and the cycle repeats itself. So I feel like this is definitely the cycle that we see in the Bible, and we definitely see this in the book of Judges. Now, a lot of times we get to the book of Judges and people are like, uh what is it, the deal with this book? It's like, it's like gory. There's really weird stuff happening. And like, how do we even explain all of these things? Like, let's get back. If we're going to be in the Old Testament, like, let's do Genesis. Let's do Psalms, you know, things that I can relate to, right? Let me tell you why we can relate to the book of Judges. Judges comes after the book of Joshua, okay? So if you understand the timeline of the Bible, what you'll see is this, this kind of period of patriarchs in the Old Testament at the beginning. You know, you had Abraham, you had Isaac, you had Jacob, and it went through all these different patriarchs who were kind of leading and carrying the mantle, the torch of, of who God was and the gospel, and God was revealing himself. Then you had this sequence of a couple of deliverers, as the Bible calls them. Moses and Joshua were referred to as deliverers. So Moses delivering the people out of the promise or out of a out of Egypt and then Joshua delivering the people into the promised land unfortunately Israel was not completely obedient <laughs> In conquering the promised land, God told them to drive out all of these nations, to destroy some of these nations just completely. And the reason was God knew if there was a remnant of people that were left in these regions, that eventually that influence would overtake his people, Israel. And so because they were disobedient, it led to the book of Judges, where there's this rising and falling of God's people. They decide to obey and to honor the Lord, but then they're swept away in, in worshiping false gods by the people who were still in the land. And I'll get to that more in a minute. But we have this cycle in the book of Judges, really seven different times. The people, they honor and serve the Lord, and then they fall, and they're worshiping false gods and, and things like that. So this particular story that we're going to look at today is the story of Deborah. The story of Deborah. And it comes after 80 years of peace in Israel. And like I just shared with you, that cycle after a time of peace, eventually God's people, and I hope you can relate to this, <laughs> eventually they do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so this is where we see in Judges chapter 4, verse 1. We open up and we see again, it says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead, who had led the people through this last season. You know, you could really do an entire sermon on just this verse, or maybe multiple sermons, this repetitive cycle over and over and over, the people once again falling into, this, falling into these ways. And um, it's not just them, you know, it's us too. And that's why I feel like the book of Judges is so relevant today when so many people don't really understand or don't really think that maybe it is. Because we go through these same cycles where we're on these mountaintop seasons and everything's great and we're serving and we're honoring the Lord. And then all of a sudden, like it's, it's over time, but we realize all of a sudden we've taken our eyes off of Christ. We've taken our eyes off of what it means to be obedient to him and to live under his spiritual authority because everything is going well in our lives. And so so then we get into this valley season where we cry out to God. And this is what's happening for Israel. In verse 2, we see, so the Lord sold them. This is a big point of conflict for a lot of people today who think that God never does any kind of harm or any kind of bad thing that we would think would be uncomfortable or, or anything of that nature. And it says here, the Lord sold his people into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan. 
Now, what you need to know about the Canaanites, the, the region, the land that Israel was in was called the land of Canaan. And so everyone who lived there were called Canaanites. There were a lot of different groups of people who were enemies of God, enemies of God's people, the Amorites, the Amalekites, all of these different groups that you'll read about in scripture. They're all in the land of Canaan. They're different kind of a conglomeration, if you will, of different nations who will, they kind of would take captive a city and then that would be like kind of their ground point where they would go from. But there's a lot of these different groups in the land of Canaan. And so Jabin is kind of leading, um, he's the king of, of this region, and he reigned in Hazor. And Sisera was the commander of his army. So remember that name, Sisera. He's going to be a big part in this particular story. So we go into the next verse. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. So this time period that they're living in here, like I said, right after Moses, right after Joshua, is on the heels of the Bronze Age, and it's the beginning of the Iron Age. So they have like these new weapons, new chariots, all of this new stuff that Israel did not have. And later when we look at kind of the numbers and the battles going on in this particular book, you'll see, I mean, this is, the Israelites were completely overwhelmed by King Jabin. There was nothing that they could really do to rise up against him. They were really, really in trouble. And historians really look at this period and there was a, a, a major like sex trafficking ring that King Jabed had. And he was coming into and stealing a lot of women in the, in the region of Israel where they were living at. And it was just this horrible, horrible time for 20 years. You know, I think sometimes we're happy to kind of raise our hands in worship and show our pit stains even, like we, we kind of let it all go when things are good you know? But then when things are bad, we're a little bit more hesitant to lift our hands in worship. It's interesting to me that it took Israel 20 years of this before they cried out to the Lord for help. How long does it take you, how long does it take me when we get into a situation, we try to fix it, we try to maybe go around about a different way other than honoring God's word and what he has said to do in the first place? It took them 20 years. This is both disheartening to me because I see myself in this, but it's also encouraging because after 20 years of disobedience to God and to his ways, he was still listening for the cry of his people. Still waiting for them to cry out to him for help. In his kindness and compassion, God disciplines his children like a good father. A lot of people, they look at passages like this, they look at scriptures like this, where God is bringing judgment, God is bringing discipline upon his people, and they don't recognize the God that they see because they believe that God is, is love and that what love means is he only does like good, kind of comfortable things. But in reality, the best thing that God could have done for his people at this time was to bring his hand of discipline upon them so that they would learn, so that they would wake up, so that they would turn around and realize the error of their ways. 20 years it took them to repent. I want us to note something here. Saying sorry communicates an emotion, but true repentance communicates a new Lord. Lord means master. And so a lot of people get this, get this mixed up. They think that repentance is just saying, oh, I'm sorry, God. But really what repentance is, is a turning. The Bible even says in scripture that God repents. Did you know that? In the book of Genesis, it says God repented of making man and sent them a flood instead. Does God do something wrong that he needs to repent? Like we think that repent is I'm saying I'm sorry. So then we're like, well, God doesn't really say I'm sorry. Like he has perfect foreknowledge. He doesn't do anything wrong. So why would he repent? That's why we don't understand because we, we mess up that definition. God did it again in the book of Jonah where it says he repented from destroying Nineveh and sent them blessing instead. Really, truly amazing. And so for us, what that means is that repentance is not just an emotion. It's not just a feeling of guilt and saying, hey, I'm sorry for what I did. Anybody can say that. What repentance is, you know, you just feel sorry. You're, you're sad you got caught. You're sad there was a consequence. That's not repentance. Repentance is to say, this was my master before. I was serving my own self. I was serving my own ways, my own desires. That was Lord to me. Lord is master. And now I'm turning and I'm communicating to you, I have a new Lord, I have a new master, I have a new direction that I'm falling under. That's what real repentance is. So we're gonna see what happens in scripture um, when we persist in perhaps even saying sorry 
but not necessarily repenting. I want to read this passage, and it's a few verses we're going to read together here. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. We're in Romans chapter 1. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they know God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claim to be wise, how many people today claim to be wise? There's a lot of tweetable pastors out there who are saying a lot of nice sounding things that maybe you can write down in your, in your journal and they're just words to live by, but they're not necessarily rooted or grounded in scripture. A lot of people claiming to be wise, but became fools and they exchanged the glory of a mortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore... God gave them over. God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And look what happens. We see this all around today. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over, we see again, to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, how much time are we spending today? Do we think it's worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God? Do you see how that's just not a surface reading? It's just in one ear, it's out the other. The Bible says to meditate on the law of God day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it. Do we count it in the church today worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God? And so God gave them over to a depraved mind. What happens? Because they weren't filling their minds with the things of God, there was nothing but to be filled with the things of the world and the lusts of the flesh, and they became consumed by their own sin. They do what ought not to be done. And look at this. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent new ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And we get to the end here. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. The Bible says, woe to the world when when a person calls what is good evil and what is evil good. We see this all over today. We see it inside of and out of the church. Brothers and sisters, we are so near the end. It is just inevitable. We need to be consuming and retaining the word of God that we might be filled with his knowledge and his power and his spirit and not just whatever wind of teaching is blowing around with the next cultural wave. This is where Israel was at in this time. And we look in verse four, now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lepidoth was leading Israel at the time. A woman leading Israel at the time. I mean, if you understand the culture, you understand, yeah, y'all are so shocked by this, I know. A woman leading Israel, if you understand this culture, it's like, it was a very patriarchal society, a very patriarchal culture. Women really had um, not much of a place in this culture, except for childbearing. And in fact, um, this this. Uh, when it says wife of Lepidoth, I have to tell you here just a little side note. We don't really know if she actually was a wife of somebody. The, the only word we have in Hebrew for this is really woman. And so sometimes it, it says in the original translation, woman of Lepidoth. So we don't really know if this is the wife of Lepidoth, the man, or woman of Lepidoth, the place. We don't really know. So I'm just giving you that as a side note. We don't really know if Deborah was married or not. The significance of this is that women in this day were one of three things. They were either a virgin hoping to get married, married, or widowed and sad that they lost their husband. 
They were only one of those three things because they didn't really stand culturally like on their own two feet. There was no such thing as a woman who just wanted to just decide to be single. That wasn't a thing. Women were very uneducated. They couldn't really provide for themselves or work except in the arena of prostitution, which is why we see so many women falling into that. If they lost their husband, if they lost their son, there was no man to provide for them. They couldn't just go get a job or work in some way. So if, if they had to feed their family, if they had to provide for themselves and there was no kinsman redeemer like in the story of Ruth, they, that's why that was such a big deal. There was no option, no opportunity for them to stand on their own two feet. So this is incredible significant that Deborah is a prophet hearing the word of the Lord. She's a judge. She's speaking to Israel and she's leading Israel at this time. Really, really huge. She held court under the palm of Deborah. So she had her own palm tree. That's pretty cool. I don't know if you just spent a lot of time there. And so they called it that, or if this was the place specifically that was like designated for her to, to judge Israel. Um, it's re- between Ramach and Beth- Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. So this is a woman, she's a woman of wisdom. She's a woman of knowledge. She has great leadership, great influence. Um, and she's very kind and generous, as we'll see later in the story, compassionate. Um, a lot of people think these days that the idea of a woman leading, right, is like it's plan B. Like if the man doesn't really step up and lead, well, then it's like, I guess the woman has to step up and lead. And I used to kind of think this myself, but that's not really what scripture teaches. I want to show you some notable female leadership in the Bible. Of course, we have Deborah from Judges 4 and 5. We have Miriam who helped to lead the people of Israel. And even actually, she was one who was so integral in saving Moses in the first place. We see that in Micah 6, 4, how she led the people of Israel. Uh, We see Anna in Luke 2, 36. You have uh, Philip's daughters in Acts 21, 9. You have the, the prophetesses at Pentecost. A lot of people don't realize this, but it says there were many women there who were prophesying from God. And then Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 11 about the prophetesses in Corinth as well. So there's definitely women, women who are leading in this time. And I know there's like a verse that comes up in, in this uh, discussion, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But what I want to say right here is that it's so easy for us to focus on the gender issues surrounding the story of Deborah that we really miss the entire point of the story in the first place. So I do want to address some of those things very briefly, but not comprehensively. Um, but what I don't want to miss is the, the main point of this story. So let's keep reading. Deborah sends for Barak, son of Abinoam, uh, from Kedesh and Naphtali, and she says to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. You may not know this, but Mount Tabor historically is really known as the same mount of where Jesus was transfigured, the Mount of Transfiguration. It's pretty cool. And she says, uh, the Lord says, I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. How sweet is that? You're you're, uh, you're you're Barak, you're the commander of the Lord's army, and you go and you hear from the prophet of God, a woman, by the way, but we're going to see that wasn't quite a big deal to him. Uh, and, And he hears, the Lord is going to give Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, into your hands in a battle. Wow, so excited. What an honor. What a privilege, right? And we read the next verse. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I will not go. This is what we call conditional obedience. (laughs) Conditional obedience. Barak had placed his confidence in Deborah rather than the Lord. How often do we do this very same thing? We place our confidence in in our husband or wife's connection to God rather than developing and nurturing one for our own. We place our confidence in our pastor's connection to God. In fact, so much where people don't even study God's word for themselves anymore. It's so sad. Back in the times of the dark ages, right, only the priests in the Catholic church could read Latin and Hebrew and Greek and all these things. So they were the only ones who could even study God's word for themselves. And people were desperate and hungry to know what God's word said. And so the translations of the Bible went out, and now we have all these translations. You can read as many translations as the Bible at, of the Bible as you want. You have resources where you can look at what the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic words were, and you can study it for yourself. But now that we have all of these things, 
It's like we've become apathetic. We've become complacent. And we put our confidence and trust in teachers and mentors and leaders rather than studying and searching the scriptures for ourselves. This is the opposite of what happened with Gideon. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you and your son and your grandson, because you've saved us from the hand of Midian. And what does Gideon say? I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Gideon understood this principle. Barak did not. In what have you placed your confidence? Family, friends, perhaps an education, a lot of young people put a lot of stock, a lot of confidence in their education. Maybe it's a career. Just confidence in that job that you have. It's security for you. It's security for your family. You've had it forever and you're planning on having it forever. That's your confidence. That's your security, your career. Maybe it's your pastor, as we've said. Government, a certain politician. Boy, do we see a lot of that right now. Just, just blind confidence in politicians. Maybe it's Confidence in tradition. This is the way it's always been. Maybe it's in religion. If your confidence is not placed unwaveringly in Christ, you will lose out on important blessings. The blessings of peace, hope, joy, faith, growth, maturity, spiritual influence that God wants to give you. Look what the psalmist said. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. This subject uh, for Barak in this day, he had a lot of trust, a lot of faith, a lot of confidence in Deborah. For a lot of men today, um, this is a a challenge because because of pride. And a lot of men I'll hear, they'll talk about, they'll say, hey, well, there's this verse in the New Testament that Paul said. <laughs> and they do, they do this whole thing, I like to call it Bible origami, where they just fold up the page just right to only see what they want to see and leave all of the rest out. For example, the passage that talks about women in, in pastoral roles and things like that. And I know this is so heated and things like blow up with comments and like people freaking out every time I ever talk about this. But the passage just before this talks about not wearing jewelry and everyone having to wear head coverings and like many other things. But we don't really worry about those kinds of things because we're not really concerned with them. And we say, well, that's cultural. But then other things in the context of the same scripture, we say, now this is so important. And, and everyone who doesn't live by this is going to hell, basically. We, have to t- we can't just fold up God's word. If something is cultural, then it's cultural. And if it's not, then it's not. And, but we have to let scripture be the judge of that. We have to let scripture decide what all of this is saying. And I do believe that God did um, instill and purpose within men this sense of leadership and, and, and within a family and within a church, all of these things. I do believe that God ordained this. But there are certain situations to where God calls women to rise up to places of leadership. This is an un undeniable principle within scripture. I want to I tell you a story here. 1973, does anyone recognize these two people? 1973, Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs, there was a tennis match. And Bobby Riggs was a, a famous tennis player. In fact, he had won um, multiple championships. He had won, I think, the Wimbledon. He had won three U.S. Open titles. He was like a champion, right? But he was aging, and he was about 55 years old, just a little outside of his prime. But because of his pride and his arrogance, he thought he'd still a really, really great player, and that he could beat any woman just because they're a woman. So he challenged Billie Jean King, who you see here. Uh, she's a 29-year-old tennis star. And it's funny, Riggs, even he wore a, uh, he practiced in a t-shirt that said, if I'm to be a chauvinist pig, I want to be the number one pig. This was the shirt that he wore as he was practicing. A different day, a different age than we're living in right now almost. Um, <laughs> there were 30,000 people who showed up for the match. And then uh, 50 million people viewed it online. Not online, but I guess on TV in that day. Uh, They viewed it on TV. And what happened was the young lady, King, she trounced him, just destroyed him. The matches were 6'4", then 6'3", then 6'3". And clearly the honor of this went to the woman. But here's the question. Was Riggs' humiliation because he lost to a girl? Or was it because 
he had been so prideful in doing so. God, he got his message through to Barak in a way that um, Barak would understand that he lacked faith. And so what God said to Barak was through Deborah that she was going to go with him, but he was not going to get any of the honor because he had displayed conditional obedience. Deborah said, certainly I will go with you. Look how merciful, look how kind. She could have been like, man, you got to be kidding me. Like God has called you to this. Stand on your own two feet and go do it your own self. She could have said that, but she didn't. She said, certainly I will go with you. But because of the course you are taking, because of your decision to, to operate in fear and to require my presence to be obedient, to do something God has called you to do, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So another woman coming into this story. And you just got to understand, guys, like in this culture, this was, I can't even tell you how huge, how monumental this was just outside of the ordinary. For us in this day and age, you know, women are educated. Women are able to do so, so many things much better than men are. In an area of physical force, God has biologically created men to just be physically stronger. It's just a fact of nature. We're not talking better or worse, just stronger in this area. It's supposed to be the man of God, the warrior of God. He's the commander of the army and he's supposed to go and to take out. And it was always the the role of the king or the commander to have the honor of taking the life of the leader of the other army. And so now he's not going to get that because of his conditional obedience or disobedience rather. (laughs) Conditional obedience is really not a thing. Conditional obedience is disobedience. And so this woman is going to get the opportunity to kill Sisera. So it's really nice. Deborah just plays along with them. Really kind, really compassionate of her. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, the tribes, and 10,000 men went up under his command. And Deborah also went with him. Probably the only woman there. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up from Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Heresheth and Hagoim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots with iron. So a couple things you got to understand. Having those chariots alone, they could have routed God's people. I mean, you know, 10 to 1, no problem for a chariot. And then on top of that, he has all of his entire army with him. So it's not just the chariots, it's the entire army. This is a bad, bad match for the people of God. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Man, that's so, that's so simple. It's so exciting. Like he should have been so excited to just run into that battle. God has given them all into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor and with 10,000 men following him, uh, at his advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. So Barak goes into this battle. The uh, the, uh, enemy army is totally routed. All of the chariots are destroyed. All of his men are destroyed. It says later on that they're all killed by sword. Let's go ahead and look at that. It says not a man was left. So they're chasing down this army. They kill every single person, except for Sisera, who's running away on foot. So now it gets to an interesting part of the story. Sisera fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin and the family of Heber. So he goes to this tent specifically to a place where he knows that there's an alliance between his king and this family. So he's going to a place of refuge, a place of safety. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come my Lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I look at this and you'll see in the story, if you don't know it already, Jael has the intent of killing Sisera. So as she's inviting him in, it's just that her deception is frightening to me. Okay. It's frightening. And I think this is why they, they say that, uh, what is it? Less than uh, 10% of serial killings are committed by women. I think that stat's actually off. I think it's women probably don't get caught as much. (laughs) Frightening, very creepy, in fact. So, okay, so she's inviting him in. Come on in, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you. And let me, she brings him in. Let me cover you up so nobody finds you. And he says, I'm thirsty. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. 
this was really interesting to me. Like, did, have you ever read this story before and you're looking and you're like, what is this with the skin of, of milk thing? Like, if he's thirsty, give him water. If you're not going to give him water, don't give it. Like, what's with the milk? As I was digging into this, this comes from the Hebrew word laban, which is like a, like a butter type of milk that they would use and it would ferment. And so what would happen is it would inebriate people, much like alcohol, and they would fall into like a really deep sleep. And they would even use it medicinally to like induce sleep. So this is what she actually very likely gave him, is something that would kind of booze him up a little bit and make him fall asleep. So my question then, I was like, okay, well, why not? Why didn't she just give him wine if that's what she was going to do? Well, the Kenites were actually descendants of the Rechabites, and they had taken a vow of abstinence against alcohol. So I'm just wondering, as a descendant of, of that group of people, if she also didn't have any alcohol there because of that. I don't know. Um, but anyways, just figured I'd give you a little note on the milk thing. So she probably kind of got him a little drunk. And then he says to her, stand in the doorway of the tent. If, anyone, if someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer. This is a big old tent peg. And went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. And she drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. No kidding. <laughs> so he's all covered up. She's got him drunk. He falls asleep under there. And, and someone was telling me because she was the woman of the tent, she didn't want to make a big mess. So that's why she covered him up. Seems like a smart idea to me. But nonetheless, she holds the tent peg up to him and she nails it into the ground through his head. Book of Judges is brutal. I mean, you look at like these movies and things and they're graphic and all this stuff is going, it's like you can really just sit down and read the Bible. Like if you want your action and all that stuff, just go through the Old Testament. Verse 22, just then, coincidence, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. (laughs) So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. Just wrapping up here today, this story is, um, it's really fascinating to me from a lot of different topics. And I hope you've been able to glean maybe a little, just something new today than, than what you've known before from this, from this passage. When I look at this, just the ending here of this, um, of this story, of this scripture, I think of Jabin um, as, the king of, as the king that Israel chose to serve rather than the Lord. In their own sin, in their own rejection of God and his ways, they were really choosing something different. They were choosing the ways of the world. They were choosing the way of sin. They were choosing to have a leader who, you know, even if it was um, like secondarily, by rejecting God, they were embracing whatever else was to come. And I see myself in that. After the hand of discipline was laid on, on them, their desperation turned them back to God. I want you to ask yourself, what will it take for you to press your hand harder and harder against the idols in your life? What, will, what measure of desperation does God have to bring you to, to get you to a place to say, you know what? No, I've been going the wrong direction. This enough is enough. That's what happened to the people of Israel. They got so desperate. They cried out to the Lord for help after they had abandoned him. We have many different spirits that, that, possess us, if you will, as Christians. There can be a spirit of fear, a spirit of laziness or apathy or complacency, um, just many different things, bitterness, jealousy, unforgiveness. I encourage you to take swift action, just like Israel did in this instance. When the opportunity came, when the call came for them to, to overrun their enemy, to overrun the idols that they had placed on these, on these pedestals in their lives. They took swift action and they pressed their hand against this pagan king until they completely destroyed him. You got to do with your idols, with the things in your life that are pulling you away from the Lord, whatever it is. I preached a sermon a long time ago called It's Gotta Go. 
And I was just listening back to it the other day and the, the word of God was just speaking to me in new and fresh ways. Even though words had come out of my mouth, it's like God speaks through his word in so many just amazing ways, d- different seasons of life that we fall into. We pick up on different things from his word. You gotta do what, what, uh, what Jael did. And that, that idol for you, whatever it is that's keeping you from knowing God more, keeping you from reading his word, keeping you from becoming a man or a woman of prayer, keeping you from being obedient to what he has called you to in his life, you got to just literally drive a, a tent peg, just stake it to the ground. Take the opportunity that comes up when the spirit speaks to your heart, when the word of God speaks to your heart. The Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as my people did in the wilderness. Respond to that spirit, to the call of the Holy Spirit, to the call of the word of God, and get rid of, take swift action against those things so that you can be filled with the the loving kindness of Christ. He's calling you in his mercy, in his grace, in his forgiveness. It doesn't matter whether it's taken you 20 years to respond to the call of God. When he calls, answer that call. And for a lot of us, we want to know the will of God. We're so concerned, which person am I supposed to marry? What school am I supposed to go to? What job am I supposed to take? Which career path am I supposed to follow? When am I supposed to do this or that? What should I do with my money? All the time we're concerned about the will of God. We want to hear the will of God. All the while, the Lord has already spoken to us the word of God. Most of our problems aren't hearing the word of God. It's refusing to be obedient to the word that we already have been given, that we already know. Barak didn't need to hear a new word from God. He didn't need a new presence of Deborah to come with him in the battle. He needed to be obedient to what God had commanded him to do. So whatever it is, brother, whatever it is, sister, those of you watching online, whatever it is keeping you from being obedient to the word of God and thus knowing the will of God, you just, you have to strike it dead. You have to eliminate the opportunity because if you don't dump out what's already in that cup of your life, all your choices, decisions, your time, if you don't then refill it with the things of God, there's just, just like Israel, they didn't get rid of everyone out of the promised land. And what happened? Later on, they had issues, things that rose back up and took the place that God wanted to be in for them. God wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their judge. He didn't want to have to do this over and over and over. But because the people refused to be fully obedient, because they were conditionally obedient to God, this is what happened. And this is what they had to deal with throughout their life. So don't just get rid of the bad things in your life. Don't just get rid of the things. Maybe they're even good things, but they're taking God's place. Don't just get rid of them completely. Refill that time, refill that energy with things of the Spirit of God, with things of the Word of God, with prayer and fasting and meditating on His Word and being around spiritual people in an environment that's going to edify you and call you higher and higher. Enthrone Jesus, not Jabin, as the king of your life today. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, and share this video with your friends to help us in our mission of keeping the hope alive. If you'd like to watch another one of our series, click here or here, and don't forget to subscribe down below. We'll see you next time.